Uh, right, fantastic. Okay, right guys, we are joined today by Professor Willie Stewart who is a consultant neuropathologist. Uh, I've actually written that down because I've been telling everybody this week about today's episode and got that wrong absolutely every time. Don't worry about it, everybody does. Every time I've done it. So you are a consultant neuropathologist and you're based at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Uh, you also lead the Glasgow Brain Injury Research Group. And I think that's probably where... I would like to start today. I'm hoping that we can. I think I think this podcast is is is, is really important for our martial arts community. And then, obviously, there's been a lot of research and, and, and discussion around rugby and NFL, American football, and things like that. But we spend a lot of time during our week punching and kicking each other in the head, and I don't think there's been enough discussion. So I'm really excited to offer not just a, my regular listeners, but hopefully this will go a wee bit wider to, to, to the, the full community. So uh, can you start off with telling us a wee bit about the work that you do at the Glasgow Brain Injury Research Group, please? Yeah, thanks. And thanks for inviting me on to, to chat. So we, um, I mean, brain injury research, let's take it back in history in Glasgow, has been a major focus of research in, in neurosciences and in brain sciences for over half a century now, um, and that that began kind of in the late sixties with colleagues in the neurosurgical, the, the brain surgery department, working alongside my predecessors in pathology and also across the university and other specialties as well. And, and the interest is, is in, in what happens when people get a brain injury. The yep. uh, brain is a phenomenally complex organ; it's remarkably fragile. And a brain injury, you know, being hit by a car, being assaulted, getting involved in a fight, um, produces a really complex injury. And, and at that time, survival rates were dreadful, management was awful, you know, making a difference was, was really tough. So, so this was an attempt to try and make a difference, try and improve outcomes from brain injury. And so really for the past 50 years or more, in Glasgow here, we've been trying to figure out what happens to people who get a brain injury? What, what, what's happening inside the brain? And what can we do to try and improve outcomes? And, and for probably 30 odd years, 40 years of that time and research, it was really concentrating on immediately after the brain injury. So you know, when you arrive at the front door of the hospital having been hit by a car, what, what can we do in the, the, the hours and days there to make a difference outcome? Yep. But what I've been doing the last 10 or 15 years is thinking more about, okay, you've survived the injury, whether that be a sports injury or, you know, car crash, what happens 30, 40 years down the line? And that, that's kind of where we're working now. So there's a group of us here working across really from the immediate injury to late on, but trying to desperately figure out how to change outcomes. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, do you know, this is one of the first questions after that I want to go into, and this might be, I don't know, maybe a silly question, I guess, but. I want you know, to, I've, got, I've got this thing, right? I always say to, to everybody who visits and students and, and whoever, the only silly question is the one you don't ask. That, that's, that's the only daft question. The yeah. one you don't ask is the daft question. Every other yeah. question is entirely right, entirely sensible. Perfect, perfect. Okay, what is a concussion? Because we throw this about all the time. Like I, I, I've said it myself, or oh, he looks concussed. <laughs> you, just, you just say it. And I'm not convinced that everybody actually knows what what a concussion is so that's why that's not a silly question because that's probably the best question <clears throat> and, it, and this best question because it's one we're still trying to answer because i can t i can tell you what concussion is, is a form of brain injury so we, we we the 50 years or more of research in glasgow one of the things that came out of it was a thing called the glasgow coma scale the gcs and you, you hear this on telly quite a lot you know yeah. in casualty you know what's his gcs and it's a glasgow coma scale and it's it's a measure of consciousness so Basically, it was invented in the 70s by one of the professors, of, now professor of neurosurgery, um, who uh, was looking for a way for when patients were being referred to Glasgow, to the hospital, um, was a way of, of knowing how conscious the patient was. Because people would say, oh, he's, he's a bit drowsy and they'd turn up and he'd be flat in coma. Or he's a bit drowsy and he'd turn up and he'd be, you know, fighting happy. Um, so, so it needed to get a, a, a better way of understanding what's going on. So they come up with this Glasgow coma scale. And what it does is it, is it measures your level of consciousness. 
And, it, and using that, we divide brain injuries into mild brain injuries, moderate brain injuries, or severe brain injuries. Okay. And concussion is, is a form of mild brain injury where you're, 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 you're pretty much functioning reasonably normal. Um, you know, you're, you're kind of, you know, often chatting, you know, um, you're, 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 you're conscious, um, but you've injured the brain. It's a mild brain injury. Okay. What we think, we, we don't really know what's happening deep down inside the brain. But, but a lot of the evidence that's come together in the last decade, possibly slightly longer, suggests that deep down inside the brain, the fine, fine fibers that run between brain cells um, are being stretched. They're kind of like electric wires, like carrying signal, telephone wires carrying a signal. Yep. And these are being stretched and pulled and just sometimes a wee bit broken so that the, the signal, that, that you know, um, phone signal doesn't quite get to where it should be. And that, that interrupts how the brain functions. So... We can see that from the outside, you know, typically somebody might get knocked out. I mean, that only happens 10% of the time with people with concussion. Yeah. Yeah. More often, people have symptoms of concussion. They don't have necessarily obvious signs of concussion. And the symptoms could be things like headache is very common. 60, 70% of people get a headache, um, blood vision, um, problems with memory and thinking, things like that. These, these are commoner uh, signs of concussion. So, just, And that's basically telling us that the the signals, the communication in and around the brain is just being interrupted in some way. And that, that's a concussion, some mild brain injury. Yeah. The, the, there seems to, there's this thing, especially, and I'm really bad for making big sweep, sweeping statements, but, uh, and I apologise to all the, the other instructors that are listening uh, in martial artists today if, if I do that, but I think generally we have this, sort of bravado in martial arts a lot of the time. Uh, on a pers- I'll give you a personal example. A good number of years ago, I fought down in Wales and fought uh, the current world champion at the time. And I am happy to admit that my head took quite a pound in that day. And I remember we had all got on a minibus to go down and come back up. So maybe we left the venue at maybe five in the afternoon and, and a few stops. We didn't get up the road till hours later, but I had a splitting headache for that full journey home and probably into the next day. Mm-hmm. And I'm probably speaking for lots of other people that have competed. So what was actually, or what do you think was actually happening in my head at that point on, I mean, on the journey home? Certainly, certainly a, a, a symptom of concussion as the commonest symptom is, is headache. Um, and, and actually you, you, you tell a good story there because, because often, you know, athletes, people participating in sport, um, don't, aren't necessarily aware of what that they've got the brain injury. They're not necessarily aware that they've been injured. And it can take hours for the symptoms to develop. Sometimes they can develop the next day. Mm-hmm. And, and these sort of symptoms we don't often think are related to concussion. The arse, a headache, you know, you've got a headache for, for a day or two afterwards. That can be a sign of, of brain injury, sign of concussion, and, and is the commonest sign of concussion. Um, so, you know, from what you're describing, it sounds very much like you might have had a concussion there. Yeah, yeah. I just, uh, I wonder how many of my, my, as I say, fellow martial artists and, do you know, actually fellow sports people have had numerous concussions and we don't even give it the, well, how much, how much, Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I mean, what, 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 I mean this is a really good point because often when, when I have conversations with, with people from sport, um, and I, I, it's, it's a number of different sports, you know, um, and, uh, you know, for instance, take, take, take rugby, um, where you can sit down in front of a professional rugby player and say, how many times have you been concussed? And they'll say, once or twice. And what they're thinking of is the occasions where they've been knocked out um, or the, the doctors come on and told them you've got a concussion, you're coming off. If you then sit down and explain to them what the, the sort of signs and symptoms of concussion are, headache, you know, fogginess, um, visual disturbance, unsteadiness of feet, a whole bunch of symptoms that are there, and say, well, how many times have you had that after a match? How many times have you had that after a bang in the head? And it goes from once or twice to, well, dozens, you know. Um, so, so I think that's the thing. One of the important things is that we as, as athletes, people participating in sport, aren't necessarily always that aware of what the signs and symptoms of concussion are, which then makes it difficult, you know, when we're talking about trying to protect people's brains from, from injury, it makes it difficult uh, if people don't understand what the signs and symptoms are. So that's why it's important to, to chat about these things as often as we can. Indeed, indeed. 
talking about protection, uh, we we so it's it's Taekwondo primarily that, that that we study, but we've been involved in lots of different open competitions with karateka and kickboxers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all different tournaments have different rule sets. But head guards is one of the big things I wanted to uh, chat about today because. I think going back, I think the amateur boxing changed at the at our, at our Commonwealth Games actually that's in right, Glasgow, right. yeah. which was the first one where they weren't they weren't worn. Where do you stand on, or what's the signs behind head guards on or off? Or that's a, I mean that's another good question. And <laughs> so essentially, we, we, we when when evolution designed this, it designed in really good protection for the brain. Um, so the brain is a kind of soft, soft, fragile jelly, which is basically floating inside your head, inside your skull. Um, and clearly, if, if we didn't have the skull there, that, that would be damaged day in, day out, because it's, it's that soft. But the skull is an incredibly good, rigid box, specifically designed to wrap around your brain. You know, it it's, it's fits each of our brains perfectly well. Yeah. It's, it's made for that job. So that, that's a really good, hard helmet. Over the surface of that, we then get the scalp. Okay, uh, and a scalp's full of pain sensors, and so whenever you bang your head, you get that instant message back through the pain sensors in your scalp saying, "Geez, that hurt! Don't do that again." And you get that pain long before you know you, you're you're banging your head and causing problems with the brain. That pain, you know, when you bang your head in a shelf, you go, "Geez, I'm not doing that again." <laughs> but if you put a soft shell cap on that, yeah, all that does is take away the pain sensation. So imagine again bang your head in a shelf without a, a soft shell cap, put a, put a soft shell cap on, bang your head in a shelf, doesn't feel so bad. Yeah. So, so the risk there is that because you're not feeling, you're not getting that feedback for pain, you're more likely to put your, your head, more likely to put your brain at risk because you're not getting the feedback. And that's kind of where boxing came at it because what, what they did was a bunch of you know, reviews of, of numbers and found out that actually the risk of concussion, risk of brain injury was, was higher, uh, potentially higher in people wearing soft shell caps than it was without. And, and rugby's done the same. You know, if you put rug, rugby scrum caps on players, the risk of concussion doesn't go down. In fact, sometimes it goes up because they're more likely to stick their head in the place they shouldn't do. And I, I watched the uh, American football yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, Dolphins against Jaggers. And uh, I was struck there again about, you know, these guys with the helmets on, how many times their heads are colliding. You can hear the helmet, helmet collisions. And, and they're not deliberate. They're just, they, this just, physicality of it yeah so so the helmets headgear they're good for protecting ears good for protecting scalp good for protecting the forehead yep. uh, but they're, they're no good at protecting the brain if anything they might increase the risk of the brain and actually we saw that in the commonwealth games because uh, a really good if you remember back in the glasgow commonwealth games when the amateur boxers first had the, the, the soft shells off there was a whole lot of of you know uh, forehead injuries and eyebrow injuries and scalp injuries which basically people were interpreting it is the guys hadn't got used to boxing without the, the headgear yet. Yeah, and so yeah. they were still clashing heads. They were still using that their, their, their head basically as another fist because yeah. they were getting in and, and bunching with it. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'm in a camp that says that for things like this, headgear actually probably for the brain is not is not a good idea because we want to you want to have it off. You want to feel the, the pain and try and keep your head out of the way, not lose that sensation and put your head where it shouldn't be. Yeah. Uh, what what actually happened? So, talking about rugby or, or American football, and then comparing that to martial arts. So, two American footballers are charging at each other. They bang heads. Uh, compare that to someone. I, I don't actually know the speed that a leg would travel. That's something I should maybe look into. But the speed of a, a leg coming up to the head and the foot or shin, which could be even worse contacting the head for a, a martial arts kick yeah. or a boxer punching the head. <clears throat> what actually happens to the brain at that moment of contact? Whether so, a head guard or, or, or not? Yeah, so, and it's interesting because it doesn't matter which um, sport you're participating in or what activity you're participating in, the brain doesn't do any different. I mean, the brain is just floating around in there, yeah. just getting carried along. It doesn't know which sport. It doesn't react differently because it's playing American football or whether it's, it's being kicked in the head. Yeah. Um, and what, what happens, think of that, you know, think of that rigid box, you know, your, your skull, and inside that is your brain floating, you know. And what happens is that as your as your head gets hit, as your, your head and skull move very quickly, 
the brain just moves slightly slower than that. So imagine you've got you know you've got a cup of coffee there. If you were to spin the cup round, yeah, you know the the the, the liquid the coffee just moves slightly behind it. You know, so you spin the cup and the, the liquid moves slightly behind it. Bowl of porridge is a good one. You know, spin a bowl of porridge and you'll see cracks start to develop yeah. on the surface. And that's sort of what's happening in the brain. That the brain is just moving at a slightly different speed to the skull, and that slightly different speed means that the, the, the brain's substance is getting stretched and twisted and, and pulled in directions it doesn't want to be. And that is what causes these fine fibres down deep inside to, to stretch. And if you think about it, if you think of, you know, say, boxing or, or you know, taekwondo or anything else where you got these direct blows, you know, they kind of, you know, you punch somebody straight in the face. Yeah. They kind of rock back on it. But if you punch them with the same force to the side, you can often knock them out or, or more likely to knock them out. It's that, it's that catching them in the side and getting the rotation of the head and getting that rapid movement that causes problems to the brain twisting rather than just being rocked back and forward. I was actually, uh, now, since we, we, we brought up the boxing there as well, I was speaking to I was speaking to a really good friend of mine about the, the Tyson Fury uh, Wilder fight last weekend. And we were talking about and again, I'll give you the boxing example, but again, this could be opened up as wide as, as we like here. Wilder, after the after the match, had, Tyson Fury had went over and uh, John T. Wilder had pretty much said, look, I don't respect you, I don't want to speak to you, etc., etc. Now, my friend, who's a fellow martial artist, was saying, I'm really disappointed in that and we should be sportsmen and good sports people. And I fully agree with that, obviously. My argument was that, and that's why I want to ask uh, you as the expert, I don't know how judgmental we should be to anybody who's who's literally... So Tyson Fury was knocked down twice in that fight and came back to one. Deontay uh, Wilder was knocked down twice and didn't make it up in time the second time. Uh, how judgmental should we be to people after a boxing match or, or, or a concussion or a, a head injury? I mean, that's fair. I mean, the... the, the... The, the the bloke you know has has as we said just had a brain injury you know he's been knocked out um, he uh, his brain is not functioning in any way shape or form as it should do and he's also in in the, the immediate aftermath of of just having lost you know such a major fight yeah and, and I, I don't think it's I don't think it's fair I mean you, we he should be regarded as a patient you know and he should be taken aside taken away and looked after and I, and I think it's it's I mean you know broadcasters will do it and, and the, 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 the fighters will respond to it. But, you know, having a microphone shoved in his face and being asked um, you know, these kind of slightly um, charged questions is uh, is unfair to say the least. So I, I don't, I, you know, I, I, lots of things can be can be said, you know, and, and you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of examples from other sports as well where uh, people with, with brain injuries who've been concussed are being asked to ask questions. Um, I, I think we should give them some space, to be honest. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree. Uh, I just, you, you said it yourself there about him suffering an injury. Look, uh, you, if it, and this is why we still don't treat this, I feel, as seriously as as it clearly is. I mean, if, if, if he'd fallen over in the ring and, and broken his leg, now I know that... It's, a, it's the same as mental health, actually. It's, it's just we don't see it. We don't yeah. we can't tell what's in, happening in the, the head at that moment. I mean, this is the thing, because, because it's an invisible injury. You know, if somebody's knocked out, it's visible. Yeah. But, but they can recover quite quickly, you know, and, and he's back on his feet again. And although he's not functioning the way he should be, he looks he looks all right. I can't say wrong with him. So, so you don't necessarily know what's going on. But as you say, had he broken his leg, um, you know, he would have been getting stretched out of there, you know, and, and people would leave him in peace. Um, so, so this is the problem. We've got this invisible injury, but it's actually, it is an injury. You know, it's just, it's a significant, if not more, broken leg, you know, damaged knee. That's okay. They heal and repair and you and you might get a bit of arthritis, but you hobble around and it won't cause you any great problems in lot, later in life. But a broken brain, a damaged brain, can be career ending. So he may never box again, you know. Um, he may never play rugby again. She may never, you know, play hockey again. You know, it's, it can be career ending. Yep. But it can also be life limiting going forward, you know, and it can also potentially lead to problems later in life. So so we need to, we need to, you know, as you say, like mental health, we need to actually get better at acknowledging it, recognizing it, treating it more seriously and, and saying this, this person's had an injury. We should be 
giving them space and treating them like we do with anybody else uh, with an injury. Yeah. I, I just, I noted down uh, life limiting there, as you mentioned that, and uh, I'll, I'll, we'll come back to that in just a wee second, but there was one other wee thing that, uh, while we're on the, the sort of boxing or the, the, the combat sports thing, or as you say, any sport, to be honest, where you're getting hit in the head, is it somewhat of a lottery how, and this will lead into my next question, I hope, but is it somewhat of a lottery how you how you react to a brain injury or consistent head trauma. What I'm getting at there is you'll have some fighters or martial artists who will speak very well, well into retirement. You'll get other martial artists and boxers who who don't. And again, as, as a complete uh, amateur as far as the knowledge side here, but you always generally just put that down to the head trauma. You think he's he's been hit too many times in the head or... Whereas some people don't, some people get hit in the head and they seem to be absolutely fine. Is that just a lottery of yeah. life? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, so we know that the, the, the one surefire thing is that if you get hit in the head with any force, it will create some sort of damage, you know. What we don't know is we can't predict how much damage can create. The reason is that um, some of genetics, you know, the, how, what, 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 what their, their parents gave them in terms of their, their genes um, can influence outcomes from brain injury. We've got some evidence from that. Um, we know that, that other illnesses you might have can influence your response to brain injury. We know that things like lifestyle, how much you drink, how much you smoke, all these other things can influence your brain and brain health. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is why brain injuries are such a complex disease, such a complex problem, because no two of us are the same yeah. and no two injuries are the same. So if you take no two injuries are the same, no two of us are the same, suddenly you've got something where it's completely unpredictable. So, and, and even on the day to day, so, you know, I, you and I could have a fight today and I could give you my hardest shot, you know, to say to your head and you could just, you know, shrug it off and say, not a problem, mate, Can't, give me some more. And then we can fight again in two weeks time. And I give you exactly the same shot and you go down like a, you know, sack potato, just collapse because things have changed with you. So maybe because I hit you two weeks before, I've weakened your brain, or maybe because you've got, you know, a, you know another illness on, on board or something else has happened. Like it's just made it slightly weaker to you or you haven't reacted as quickly as you should do to that blow. So, so it, it, in each individual, you know, between individuals, there's a com completely unpredictable what can happen with, with one blow to the next. And within individuals, it's quite unpredictable as well. But we do know that some people, seem to be fairly resistant to injury. Yeah. Other people have, you know, the, the colloquial glass jaw that, that you just tap them when they're down. Um, but between those, we don't know. We do know, though, that your risk of getting concussion increases if you've had previous concussions. So, and, and we can see that sometimes with sports like, say, say rugby, where towards the end of a player's career, they seem to be getting more and more injury prone. Um, so yeah. more and more injuries, more and more concussions. And, and that may be because of the cumulative effect of, one after the other after the other. But this is the magic uh, of, of doing these sort of long forum chats on podcasts because I still haven't got to the question I want to ask you. <laughs> but just as you were talking there, another, what something you said sort of popped into my head. Uh, but that's it's so interesting you mention the, you, you seem to be more susceptible the further you go on because in, in combat sports especially, you'll have fighters who, who seem to have sort of granite chins and, and take blow after blow and maybe they're, they're reigning champions and, and they, they never ever get knocked down or, or, or knocked out and then it snaps and it happens and you might see this person who was in the top of their game for so long lose by knockout the next four or five fights. Uh, is there signs behind that that that's what's happened? There's an awareness of it. I mean, they, so so we know it happens, but but we don't have the science to explain why it happens. Um, you know, they, you know, so people have been. <laughs> I mean, there there are skulls from back in in the kind of you know the, the sort of stone ages where there's there's lumps at the top of the skull where clearly uh, back in those days, you know, the the the, the, the kind of the the. <laughs> The people around about then picked up a, a rock or a, a lump of wood or something and smacked the mate over the head of it and knocked yeah. them out or killed them and thought, oh, there you go. That, that happens. And then, of course, we get into battle and it becomes part of normal. So we've been hitting each other over the head. We've been hit over the head for 
for centuries, eons, but we know very little. It's only the last you know, century or so that we've started to try and figure out what's happening in brain injury, and only the last 30, 40 years that we've started to have the, 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 the science needed to start to pick this apart. And that's a vanishingly short space of time in science. So, so we know that you know, women are more likely to get concussed than men if you play sport for sport. We know that young people are. We know that if you've had a previous injury, that your risk goes up. But, but beyond that, we don't understand really why these things are the way they are. Um, but there's a lot of work going on to try and figure that one out. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, uh, the, the, the question I have for you next uh, is about children in, in, in sport. And in my school, for example, we, we do very little contact. And the, the more, over the last few years, I've been trying, trying to read up more about this and, and just be more aware of it. Uh, and be even more p- protective of my junior students, if that was sort of possible, round about how often I have them sparring. And there's, I still see footage daily of, of different martial arts schools where the kids are absolutely hammering each other. Now, again, that goes back to this, are they wearing, we thought that was a good thing to have the head guard on. We're now learning that it, it, it's probably not. We still have big boxing gloves and foot guards, but the kids are still taking blow after blow. And I've really pulled back almost completely on that. So can we talk about children? What what, what would your advice be if, for kids making contact in rugby or American football or in martial arts? Yeah. <clears throat> so again, you know, the, the, there's, there's, there's the kind of science and there's the evidence and then there's the just gut feeling, you know, public yeah. health, what, what, what sounds like it right, uh, was taking a, a kind of pragmatic, safe, sensible approach to a uh, precautionary principle. So there is some science that suggests that, for instance, in American football, uh, the younger your exposure to contact American football begins, the more likely you may be to develop problems later in life. So the, the dementia pathology that we, we recognise, some of the other issues as well. And that, that, that evidence has been debated back and forward, but I think there's enough to suggest that, you know, maybe we should just take it easy with younger people. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't be exposing them early on. And even if one argument is that it's not so much that they're young players when they're exposed, it's more to do with the length of time they're exposed. So, you know, if you start, if you're exposed at five and retire at 35, that's 30 years. If, if you expose the 15, retire at 35, that's 20 years. So maybe it's the 30 years, not the five. Um, but either way, we, we feel that, that whether you're just cutting down the length of exposure or, or protecting the, the young brain, it's, it's sensible to keep head impacts out of the way there, or head injury out of the way there as much as possible. The other thing is young brains are developing continuously. Um, you know, the, the, you know, one, you know, brains develop right way through to early 20s. There's all sorts of things happening in there about them growing and developing and, and, and just forming your adult brain effectively. Yeah. Uh, once you get to your 20s, it stabilizes for a while. And when you get to your 40s and 50s, you begin to you know, head down the other side of the slope. But, but you've got that you know, developing important period in life, which is obviously where we pour as much education into kids as possible as well. So we want to protect that as much as possible. You know, we don't want to um, risk the development of the brain. We don't want to risk the educational um, value that, that we may get from, from school. So, so again, that's another reason for just limiting exposure to brains. And then there's another thing that in adolescence in particular, whatever's happening in developmental in that adolescent period means that adolescent brains, for some reason, with an injury that, that younger people and older people might get, which is neither here nor there, but for some reason, these very trivial, mild injuries in young people can lead to the brain just swelling uncontrollably. And it's incredibly rare, incredibly rare, but it does happen. And when it happens, it can lead to death. And it's a thing called second impact syndrome because we believe, or in many of these cases, the kid has been hit in the weeks before or days before, and a second impact leads to uh, the brain swelling uncontrollably. I'm not sure that two impacts is required. I think it can can happen after one. But whatever, in adolescence, in that kind of teenage years, just a a very trivial bang in the head can lead to really significant problems. So, So these are good reasons for just saying, look, if it's not to protect brains in 40s, 50s, 60s because of you know the long-term exposure, if it's not to protect 
you know, the, the brain is developing in adolescence. But if it's, you know, we're always going to think about protecting the life of the kid as well by avoiding that really significant serious injury. So for all these reasons, I think it's a good idea to minimise head impacts in kids as much as possible and, and definitely get better at recognising uh, brain injuries for they happen in that group. Um, and if you look at football, for instance, the Scottish football the past year or so um, took a look at youth football and decided actually there was very little heading went on under 12. So why bother training for it? You know? yep, yep. Um, and, and, and adolescents really controlled limited heading um, to, to kind of, again, just protect as much as possible. We're, we're, we're nowhere near the science that supports a lot of these things, but I think we've got enough precautionary principle in us to say this is, this is not going to do any great harm. Yep. I think people, I think amateur level sport, uh, and again, this is the next place I would like to take the, co the conversation on to. I think a lot of amateur, I, I've been to tournaments in the past and, and I've seen rugby matches or football matches. I've seen young fighters clearly take a hit to the head, fall to the ground, and then you stand there and you question the the standard of care afterwards. Because in some instances, are you, they, they're picked up. Are you okay? They give their face a wee wipe and they send them back into the fight. And that happens as well in football and rugby. Uh, someone clashes heads or and then they're put back in. Surely we must be in a place now where that we know that that's wrong. So we, we yeah, we're very much, and uh, for the last um, five or six years at least, um, we've been working in, in Scottish sport, Scottish government, um, right across Scottish sport, to try and address that. Now, the problem is that, that you know, you're talking about, um, you know, most, most people when they're watching sport are watching elite level sports. So they're seeing Saturday afternoon football, the rugby, the American football the other day there, or watching, you know, the, the boxing or, or Olympics where there's, you know, elite athletes participating. But behind those elite athletes, are really supremely qualified experts in sports medicine who are just standing off to the, the side and in, in some sports you're running on back and forward looking at the players now they they're experts and they've got um an expert's eye to the problems to look out for and have the backup of you know if there's a, a football match over at hamden the hospital here is on standby um waiting for for anything that might come through the door Yep. Um, if there's boxing in town, the hospital's on standby because the facilities are here. So there's all those those exceptionally qualified and skilled individuals waiting to look after the, the, the participants' health. Yep. But when you go into the amateur level, none of that's there. You know, you've got the coach, you've got a teacher, you've got a parent. You know, that's it. So so at that level, we don't talk about you know tests for, for concussion or you know scans for concussion or anything else. We just talk about suspicion of concussion. If you suspect any of your athletes has had a concussion or may have a concussion, that suspicion is enough. If in doubt, set them out. So if you suspect they've got a concussion, you just take them off for yeah. their own protection um, and don't put them back in there. So don't dust them off. Don't you know put a towel to them. Don't ask them questions you know, to try and see if they've got a concussion or not because they're, they're useless. Um, and actually, that's what happens you know, at the... Uh, elite sport as well are supposed to happen if in doubt sit them out yeah. the reality is that, that of course they, they blur the edges of that but these are professional athletes with professional doctors they've all got you know insurances to to look after them that doesn't happen and, and go back to that real concern about adolescence if in doubt sit them out because what we don't want is kids who are 12 13 14 15 any age really yeah. but that adolescent years being checked out by somebody who doesn't know what they're doing who thinks they're okay to carry on, who sends them back in there, and then the catastrophic injury comes and the kid never gets back up again. You know, there's yeah. always another fight next week. Yeah. Yeah. You know? But but if the kid's you know in hospital or worse, they're not going to make that fight. So sit them down, explain and it can be tough, you know, saying to the kids, I'm sorry, I'm doing this for your own good. You're just going to sit down and watch the rest of the day, you know, yeah. enjoy it. You know, yeah. Yeah. you're back next week. It's it's one of the main reasons why I uh, don't take my, my own students uh, or athletes to as many tournaments nowadays. Uh, being perfectly honest, it is. It's, I just I'm trying to look at these kids and and adult students as well, not just the children, but try to look at my students and 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 think about their life overall. I really do, rather yeah. than 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 just their their taekwondo 
or competition career because it's just not worth it. So what, level. What, one of the things we found was that because uh, <coughs> kids are into all sorts of things. So, you know, a kid can be doing Taekwondo uh, you know, a couple of nights a week, but he's also playing for the school football um, and he likes a bit of badminton and there's a bit of swimming and basketball and all this. So kids are doing all sorts of stuff. And what we found was that part of the part of the mess that people were getting into was that uh, if you're if you're down at the Taekwondo, the management of head injury and, and concussion was slightly different to if you were you know up the rugby pitches, and that was a completely different to swimming, who probably didn't have anything at all. Yeah. Uh, so so we found that actually there was just mixed messaging. You know, some of it was really good, some of it was dreadful, some of it didn't exist. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things I did. I, I went through with one of my students. You know, every sport in the UK we could think of, all the websites and tried to find out information on concussion and, and how to manage it. And where we couldn't find it, and we phoned them up. Um, okay. yeah. I think, you know, Taekwondo, I'm sure, would have been in there. I phoned them up and said, like, what, what do you do if the kid's concussed? And we found out that actually when you looked at 50, 60 odd sports, only half a dozen or so of them had any information at all. And we looked at that, it was, it was by and large not brilliant. Um, so that gave us the idea that maybe what we could do to address this is rather than just sit back and criticise, we come up with something. So we, we come up with this, it's called the Scottish Concussion Guidance, yeah. which is published with is a Sports Scotland, Scottish Government, universities, major sports. And it, that covers everything. So the idea is that if you're in Scotland, you're participating in amateur or grassroots sports, table tennis, fencing, boxing, taekwondo, horse riding, whatever, whatever it is, football and rugby, the management's the same, the message is the same. If in doubt, sit them out, and everything else after that is the same. So you can't then, you know, turn up uh, at swimming on a Tuesday and say, like, I knocked out at Taekwondo on Saturday, but it's fine because I'm swimming, so I can just jump in the pool. Yeah. The, the, swimming, the swimming coach can say, actually, that's not because I'm, you know, it's the same policy we're using here. Yeah. Away with you. Um, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, so I think it, it's, 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 but, but what we need to do is make sure that message gets out because. Uh, you know, I, our sense, we're, we're now, believe it or not, on the third version of that Scottish Concussion Guidance and still the only country in the world where there's one concussion guidance has been disseminated or passed out to all sports. Um, and we're in our third version of it. You know, some of our colleagues not so far away are still to get version one out. And, and the third version, what we realised is that whilst we've got this great document, this great guidance, which is on the website of Sports Scotland, and it's really useful and it's really simple and accessible. Not, it's not getting to everybody the way we'd hope. Um, so when you go and speak to some coaches in sports, they say, I don't know anything about that. And you're going to speak to some teachers, they say, I never read that. Um, so, so we're now trying to figure out ways of getting it more widely disseminated. Football and rugby picked up quite quickly because they've got the big organisations. But, yeah, but yeah. The, the, the less sort of common sports, um, we found it hasn't quite got out the same way. So, so we're going to have to work on that now. Here's... here's- uh, here's quite a big question, and the one is this, I mentioned just before we sort of started recording about the one of the previous podcasts you you, you done uh, around rugby, and you were talking about rule changes, mm-hmm. and I know the uh, NFL American football have changed rules, which hopefully you can give us a wee bit more information on as well here. But where where is competition? Where is it heading? So am I being Am I being ridiculous to say that we shouldn't have sports like boxing or taekwondo or mixed martial arts where the where the the, the point is is to knock another human being out? So or, uh, or not? No, I mean I, I I I I you know I'm not I'm not for banning anything, but really, um, and and, I, and I I'm I'm a, I'm a great advocate in physical activity and sport, you know. So all physical activity, all sport has benefits in many different ways, you know, and, you know, coming from the West of Scotland, you only just have to look around to see how much more physical activity can be doing to try and improve the health of the population. So, so I'm not, you know, and, and, and people have different ways of getting it. So, you know, West of Scotland, we used to play football religiously. That was, that was what we did in the playground, you know, it was, it was football, football, football. I was rubbish at it, you know, and I, and I used to just hack people down because that was all I could do or play in goal, you know, because I was a liability. I was always a goalie too, by the way. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> So then, uh, and, and like you do, you know, as you, as you kind of get to kind of, you know, six, seven or so, you start to kind of experiment with other sports. So I had a go at karate, no good at that either. Uh, I had a go at a few other things. And, and rugby, you know, I had a go at rugby. Turned out 
my hacking people down and and you know basically manhandling folk to the ground was quite useful in rugby. So I ended up in rugby. Yeah. Where I got that's what I did. But but you know that, that doesn't work for everybody. Some some people it might be boxing, it might be taekwondo gives them the exercise, the discipline, what, what they're looking for, you know, the camaraderie um, that, that they need, that, that works for them. Um, so by all means, I think there's, there's you know, if you're going to do it, do it. But, but it's about looking after people who are participating in those sports. And actually, oddly enough, I think because of, of so many of the problems to do with brain injury in sport, we recognised in boxing at the beginning of last century. Yeah. And over the last century, it was all about boxing. It was all about the problems with boxing. And there was more and more problems and those brains being examined and the boxers being examined. There were issues there. So, so boxing, just you know, towards the end of last century, said, right, you know, here's the situation. Either we react to this or the game's up. You know, we're literally going to have to stop, ban it. You know? So they reacted. So they produced um, safety protocols, certainly for elite athletes, you know, for, for the, the license they could get to box, um, in co- including brain scans every year, including brain health checks every so often, and actually telling them if any of these changes were starting to show up, they'd have to stop. Mm-hmm. And if they get concussed, knockout. So uh, Wilder, um, he he would be out for, I think, probably three months now. So, yeah. so you know, if they get knocked out, um, you know, a technical knockout's a month, you know, knockout when you're out for several seconds is longer. So, so you're talking about time out of the sport, yeah, issued in weeks, months. So actually, combat sports, and I, I think Taekwondo is in the in the group as well. That's got a combat sport regular guidelines now. I actually got, you know, I think they're fairly fairly safe. You know, if, if they recognise a brain injury, you know, the management of it's pretty good. Yeah, compare that to rugby or football though. You can get knocked out, as I said earlier, you know, the, the, the brain doesn't know which sport it's playing in. It, it's injured the same way. So you could be knocked out in boxing and be out for weeks. You could be knocked out, the same injury in rugby and be back playing the next weekend. So, so I, th- I think, you know, it's not a matter of just saying the sport of Taekwondo, sport boxing, where you're setting out to inflict a brain injury should be banned or is awful in some way. I think there's there's there's... there's as many, if not more, problems in other sports where we don't set out to inflict a brain injury, but it happens. Yeah, you know, I think we could do with working on these. And ultimately, what we want to achieve is everybody participating, whatever sport they're comfortable with and they get the most from, but with with the best safety. You know, yeah. People say, yeah, but but you know, it's part of the the glory of the sport. It's part of what we do and all the rest of it. Formula One racing, completely sidestep. Formula One racing in the seventies was a glorious sport. Yeah, you know, cars would race; it'd be carnage, literally. The yeah. people were dying. Yeah, you know? yeah, and so they had to change the rules to improve the safety of the cars. And people say, "Well, you know, once you start introducing these safety rules, it's not the same sport." You know, it carries on. Even go back a few years, the halo system to protect from head injury after the remember the wheel came off and hit the guy mm-hmm. to induce this this kind of it's almost like a crash barrier across the top. But people say that's ridiculous. You know. Won't be able to see the, the drivers, won't be the same, you know, gets in the way of the driver. The drivers objected to it because of getting in the way of the vision. It saved lives already and all and, and suddenly it's forgotten about. So we can change. Sport can be tweaked based on what we know now. We didn't know the risks for football, we didn't know the risks for rugby until quite recently. So so well, we'll react to that, we'll tweak it. And you know, a year or two from now, nobody will know the difference. American football, you raised that. Yeah. American football over the last decade has changed its rules almost season by season to try and reduce the, the number of, of head injuries and head impacts. Uh, and at the time, the fans said, this is crazy. You know, you're, you're destroying our sport. You know, I won't watch it. You know, I don't know if they've got season tickets, but the equivalent of, you know, turning up the season tickets. The NFL carries on, you know, and the stadia are full week in, week out. Um, and, and now everybody's forgotten about it. Is there, is there a... Is there a um, uh... Is there a marked improvement there statistically? Is there can can you look at records in the NFL or or, or rugby where things have been changed and then say, well, here's the evidence that that has actually so, made a difference? So the in the NFL they did see some a decline in, in concussions in, in several seasons, but I think it's kind of changed slightly. Um w- what they've done though is that they recognized that there was a there was a chunk of the concussions were coming from from training days. Yeah. Um, and they said, well, actually, why don't we just get rid of, of the contract training as much as possible? Because that's going to, you know, even if we, we haven't managed to fix the problem in, this, in the games, 
we've at least taken away the risk in, in training. Rugby is going down a similar line by trying to cut back on the, the amount of training exposure as well. So, so there's there's a limit to how often professional rugby players are now supposed to um, get involved in contact training. Rugby did r- rugby did an analysis looking at, at um, concussions and found that it was the tackles where the problem was. It was because the they, they were kind of heads up, you know, the, the colliding rather than yeah. tackling each other. And the, the tackler was was kind of clashing heads and, and getting knocked out or getting concussed. And so they came up with a rule that the, the, the tackle should be lower and it had to be, you know, directed lower. Yeah. Unfortunately, unintended consequences. What they then had mid-season, literally, was big men who'd, who'd spent their entire professional careers just colliding with each other heads up. And, and one of them now had to kind of bend down and try and tackle the other one lower yeah, down. Yeah. And of course, while it, when I played you know, schoolboy rugby, that was how we did it. We tackled, you know, below the waist. These guys never really done that properly. Yeah. And so it was carnage. The the the, the level of concussion went up. And, and, and so it was unintended consequences. They were trying to reduce risk, but in fact they increased it. So so it's it's it, it does it, it's going to require continuous, you know observation monitoring continuous adjustments of rules to try and produce change but but you know i think i think sport's trying to because again it's, it's back to where boxing was if they don't change then it's, it's going to be the end of the game because you know it people will just vote with their feet american football suffered great losses and participants because parents were worried about the risk so yeah i think i think you, you did touch on this when you answered that question there about there is a risk reward ratio as well i mean we were talking about this just the other night about uh, so it always happens after a a, a, a really publicised fatality sometimes or just a really bad injury. Uh, going back a few decades now, when uh, uh, Michael Watson Watson yeah yeah when Michael Watson uh, was injured in the Chris Eubank fight and. <sighs> There was a, there's there's outcries all the time. Oh, this this is horrific. It should be banned. But what we don't see is the the thousand, possibly millions of worldwide kids that are taken off the street or given direction in life or healthier lifestyles through that that sport. I don't think it's just as common as what we think it is or what's publicised how dangerous it actually is. No, and and you know it, again, it's uh, it's it's. You know, I, I think you know ev- everything in life has got a risk. Yeah, you know? uh, everything in life. I mean, I, I cycle in and out to work, and that's that. Tell me that, that that's risky. You know, I've, I've been uh, knocked off twice, um, gone over the bars at least as many times. Um, yeah. So, so it's risky. But but I do it because you know I'm trying to stay healthy. I'm trying to stay active. All the rest of it. Um, but but the risks in that, I think, are low. Actually, if you look at hospital admissions, if I go across the road to my my colleagues at the front door. And uh, asked them to give me a, a list of who they, who they admitted with head injuries, brain injuries, in the past month. You probably find there are more cyclists in there than there are anything else, um, yeah, and, yeah. And, and probably rarely a boxer, <laughs> and yeah. uh, and rarely a rugby player. Now there's, there's lots of cyclists and perhaps not as many boxers, but you know we tend to just you know focus on on as you say the, the high you know um, visibility uh, injuries and assume that applies across the whole board. And of course, you know. Uh, I, I mean, I do, I do, you know, I, I think, you know, take football as a good example. From the research we've done, uh, we found that our, our former professional footballers, when we, we looked at them, were um, they had less heart disease, they've got less mental health problems, they've got less lung cancer, they're living slightly longer. So they're, they're, this is a picture of health. Yeah. But one problem. One big standout problem is that risk of dementia was very, very much higher than it should have been. Yeah. Uh, now, that risk of dementia we think is quite easy to fix, you know, by dealing with this head injury and, and head impact thing. So if we can get rid of that, you know, arguably we're going to end up with people who are even healthier than we're seeing already. Yeah. So, so the answer is, you know, just because of this risk of dementia, the answer to to solve the problem is not to ban football, you know, ban the game of football. The answer is to right. Let's take away the risk from football and carry on with the benefit of it. And I'd say the same for you know combat sports as well. There are definitely risks there, but if we manage the, the sport to reduce the risk as much as possible, we retain that benefit. You know, and and of course, it, I just I'm just not one to to ban things that 
yeah, you know, have have benefit. Um, you know, until we've we've actually done our best to maximise the benefit and minimise the risk. No, completely. Uh, I've got one more question for you, and sure. there's been a wee bit of serendipity there that I like again. I mentioned this earlier on, but you kind of started touching on it there, and it's going to way back to the beginning of the conversation about the Glasgow brain injury research yeah. group. Yeah. Uh, and this might be a, a really good question for you, or, or, a, or a really bad one. I'll try, try. I'll chance this. What's your ultimate aim for the the the, the decades now of research that you you have done there? What's the if I was to say right? What's the ultimate outcome you want from this? Uh, what would you What would you answer? <laughs> there's, there's a lot, but I mean, <clears throat> I think you know, just talk, keep talking along the lines we've been talking about, kind of sports and brain injury stuff. I think the ultimate goal would be to have all these sports preserved. So, you know, people are still playing football, still participating in Taekwondo, still boxing, still whatever they want to do. But but the risks to their brain and brain health, so so their brain from brain injury that day uh, and their brain health the rest of their life have been very, very much reduced. And and we think of that, so, that, so that, you know, to, to break that down, there, we, we think of it in three life phases now. So you've got the early life where you're still participating in the sport. Yeah. So, so we're actually working really hard to convince our friends in sport to find ways of cutting down on unnecessary head impacts. So that's in football, you know, the heading during the week, rugby, the contact uh, training during the week, can we cut down on that as much as possible? Keep it, keep it for the match day, you know? Yeah. Let's just figure out how to get rid of the stuff during the week. Because there may only be 10 headers on a, on a Saturday, but but the same players doing 100 during the week to practice. So let's get rid of those 100 and just stick to the 10. That's what everybody wants to see. Yeah. Get better at recognising concussions. So get better at recognising brain injuries. So if in doubt, sit them out, make sure everybody gets that message. But in other sports, improving what they're doing, get better at what they're doing. So that, that's for current athletes and people, people just in this sport. Once you leave the sport, though, when you get to kind of you know my age and, and your you know, sporting days are long behind you and rugby is long behind you, I've got my injury. There's nothing I can do about it. My, my, my head's been banged around as much as it's, you know. Yeah. So what are we doing to improve the prospects for people like me who've left sport and who are you know in that midlife bit before they get to the age of developing dementia? And that's, we're really going to do some work with that. In the next few weeks, you'll see things coming through about trying to just encourage people to, take ownership of their brain health, you know, look after the diet, look after activity, look after, you know, um, smoking and drinking, stuff like that. And then all of this is to try and figure out, you know, ultimately how we can stop the dementia happening later in life. Unfortunately, we don't have a treatment for dementia. We don't have the treatment for degenerative brain disease. If you get dementia, there's nothing we can do to slow the progress of disease. It's too late. And that's because we think this is a disease that starts um, early in life that, that by the time you, you turn up with Alzheimer's disease you've probably been brewing it for 30 40 years right. um, so coming up with a drug for a disease that's been brewing for 40 years is probably too late yeah. we need to figure out how to change the course of disease early in life and that's, that's kind of that's an ultimate goal I guess is if we can prevent it brilliant for those that we can't prevent it what can we do to treat it at, at the earliest possible stage so that's kind of where we're working at the moment it's ambitious, but you know, you don't have an ambition at this point. Absolutely. Uh, Professor Stuart, that's been wonderful. Uh, the as I say at, at the beginning, it's it's this subject that I think we're I'm speaking specifically about combat sports. I think we are moving slowly, not as fast as, as I would like, but to have you on the podcast today and hopefully send all of this information out to at least my community is is has been fantastic. So Thank well, you, no, it's, it's been a pleasure chatting, and uh, and I, I, we managed to get through that without touching on too many of your questions, which is quite good. But the the uh, the conversation is better than a, an interrogation, I think. But, but if I was to say one thing to to direct people for more information, please, Sport, Sport Scotland, you know, it, you know, Sport, Scottish concussion guidance. There's tons of really good information there, just about simple ways of of you know thinking about concussion, and it's basically around different doubts sitting them out, but but also tells you once you've sat them out. What happens next? And that's that's kind of the, I guess, the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Do you just before I let you go, do you have any public social media uh, accounts that people can follow for? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, I've got a Twitter account which is uh, Will Stu Neuro. W I L L S T E W N E U R O. Will Stu Neuro. Perfect. Right, uh, Professor Willie Stewart. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, Thank you very much.
Very much obliged. Okay, take care. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.